Good morning. My name is Jeff Mucci. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, today's discussion is going to be about collaborating to make America's communications network secure. Uh, my name is Jeff Mucci. I'm CEO of RCR Wireless News. Uh, how many of you guys subscribe to RCR Wireless News? If you don't, you need to. Um, RCR has been around since 1982, and many of the leading journalists in the industry today started their careers at RCR Wireless News, including our own Mike Dano, who's in the office uh, in the uh, in the in the room today. So, Mike, thanks for joining us. Um, prior to acquiring RCR Wireless News nine years ago, I spent 15 to 20 years building and running. Um, communications networks. So in, in 97, I started a facilities-based CLEC, deploying 5E switches and building metro fiber networks. In 99, I was CEO of one of the largest DSL companies in the country, deployed over 400 central offices, physically co-located um, DSL networks in 400 offices in, in uh, 12 months. So we deployed $100 million worth of capital in one year. Um, I was part of the founding uh, Clearwire team that Goldman Sachs backed to assemble a nationwide uh, network of ITFS spectrum. We took it through the FCC and rebanded the plan for, two, for cellular. So I've got a little background in, in running networks. And it's interesting, as I prepare for today's uh, discussion, you know, we didn't really think about securing a network over the past 15 years. But today, as we move from 4G wireless networks to 5G wireless networks, um, the race to 5G is really the race to building 5G properly. And there was an article recently that um, uh, Tom Wheeler, the FCC commissioner, published um, a report to the Brookings, uh, from the Brookings Institute that talked about it's more important to aim uh, for 5G properly and put in place the, the proper cybersecurity uh, in, the, in the standards today. And so what we're gonna talk about today is what, what does it really take to secure America's network, but what it really takes to develop a secure network globally. We've got um, three great panelists. Kevin Jackson, who is known as, uh, he's a Naval Academy grad. He's known as one of the top 5G influencers in the world. He's written a couple books, including um, Practical Cloud Security and Architecting Cloud Competing Solutions. Kevin, Great. thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Tony Scott is a policy advisor for Pat Boggs today. They're one of the largest uh, law firms in the world. Prior to uh, working with Pat Boggs, uh, Kevin served as CIO for the U.S. government under the Obama administration and also served as CIO for the Disney company, Microsoft, and VMware. Thanks for joining us. And finally, we have Andy Purdy, who is the Chief Security Office, Officer for Huawei Technologies USA, and uh, he's an attorney by training. Uh, he was also a senior cybersecurity official of the U.S. government. Um, and Andy, you're part of the White House team that developed and drafted the U.S. National Cybersecurity Plan in 2003. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Good. So I'm going to start with you, Kevin. Okay. And the first question is, what are some of the real threats to America's communications network? As the carriers transition to these highly automated cloud-based infrastructures, everything is based on software. Uh, your your appliances are now uh, virtual appliances. Uh, you are no longer buying things to deploy. You have software that you have to configure. Even your infrastructure is now, everything is software-based. So your threats are software-based as well. It's very important for you as a carrier to understand what this means to your own operations. As I say on the slide, there is a real lack of cybersecurity education because historically you have been focused on physical things and the threat is coming from a completely different direction now. Um, also, your, your enemies are going to exploit the interfaces uh, because everything in your infrastructure, all of your services, are being driven by application programming interfaces, APIs. Uh, so it's important for you to understand that these are simply black boxes uh, in a software point of view, and that you may not know what's going on inside, but operationally you have to manage what can be used and how it should be used. 
all of these really drive to a change in your operations, a, a change in a view of what a telecommunications network is. So critical to that is global standardization because competition or your competitive posture is really not the technology itself. Your, com your competitive strength should be in the services that you're delivering. But primary to all of this is the security of the data and the security of the information for your customers and for everyone that depends on your services. So standardization enables that automation. It also enables visibility across your infrastructure and in turn enables you to have a higher level of security across your infrastructure. One of the things we need to talk about is that how do we build an ecosystem? Because everyone is participating in developing and implementing this security across the ecosystem. It goes from your customers, your clients, your infrastructure, your operations, and the government. And I think a lack of a consistent pattern, uh, consistent rules, is also a major threat to the cybersecurity of our current and future telecommunications infrastructure. Thank you, Kevin. Let's um, maybe talk about the, um, the role of each of the players, and this will be a, a group conversation here, but let's talk about the role of telco operators, the equipment vendors, um, government in putting in place. You talked about that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So what's the role of each one of those? Maybe you take one of them and we can go down the line. Um, the role of those constituents and stakeholders in, in developing cybersecurity. So one of the biggest challenges is in culture, um, in changing the mindset of what it takes to be an effective telco operator. Uh, so from the top, the telco operator needs to really understand and appreciate the changes in culture, the changes in operation. And this requires, this could require a great deal of education. It will definitely require different uh, approaches to designing and operating your infrastructure and the relationships that you put in place with the service providers that are using your infrastructure uh, to provide you know, critical services to your joint customers. And Tony, what, uh, you spend time on the public sector side and the private sector side. What do you think the role is of a government versus a private company? Well, I think government has to be engaged in this big time. And I think there's certain roles that it's incumbent on the government to, to play. First is establishing a good governance framework. And this is including, you know, legal uh, frameworks, regulatory frameworks, uh, uh, government standards like NIST does and, and so on, having clear, um, you know, policies and, and uh, processes in that space, I think, sets the ground for um, a, a good and healthy environment. But the government also has another role, which is, I think, um, fostering innovation by encouraging uh, better R&D and Government is a big spender in the technology space. Uh, the The federal budget when I was there was, uh, you know, ninety billion dollars uh, in IT, and <clears throat> by anybody's standards, that's a lot of bucks to, uh, with which you can influence things. Um, and and I think as as was mentioned, I think education is one of the key roles where I would say government's not necessarily doing enough. If you take private institutions like the Girl Scouts who are giving, you know, I think 60 or 70 different badges now 
uh, in the tech space, um, you know, they're doing more, the Girl Scouts are, than some government institutions who I think could be doing a better job. So um, I, I think that's a, a space where we really got to step up uh, because good, um, good security, good uh, practices here are going to end up being everybody's job. Um, and, and so those things are important. Um, and then I think finally government has a convening role um, to bring together the right players from government and industry to collaborate on uh, where we want the future to go. And uh, I think that's a really important part of uh, what government can do. What should government not do? Well, from my perspective, it's picking winners and losers. Um, uh, and, you know, you see that play out in a whole bunch of different ways. But I think that's a dangerous game. I think the role of government is to set a level playing field and make sure that it is a level playing field and that all the parties' uh, equities and interests mm -hmm. are uh, taken into consideration. But I think picking winners and losers starts to be a dangerous uh, space yeah. in particular. Yeah. One thing I wanted to sort of um, dovetail in on your comments, uh, Tony. Last night I had the opportunity to speak with a lot of the operators. And while many of us would like to think that innovation and improved services is really what drives decisions, uh, I heard from many, uh, many organizations that said it's the government, governmental grants that are driving their decisions, not the desire or need to provide innovation, but the choices that they are able to make based upon funding. So governmental grants sort of uh, can stymie innovation. And I think that's an important aspect of how government can actually hurt innovation in an unexpected way. Uh, I want to get back to Tony and just um, um, ask about the industry and the role industry will play in um, transpar um, tra uh, transparency and verification. Well, I think by anybody's measure, there's more that we can do in that space. Um, part of the problem I see is, you know, at what point does transparency you know, hinder competition and at what point does it help it? And again, this is where there's got to be a good intersection between government and, and industry so that um, if you are transparent, it can't be used in ways that are anti-competitive or, or um, uh, injurious to uh, uh, moving forward. Um, the, uh, and, and it also, transparency is a word that I think is broadly used to mean a whole bunch of different things. Um, so I think we've got to even more precisely define what we really mean by transparency. Um, but I, I think the best transparency comes from uh, things like the use of open source, for example. Um, I, I sponsored a bill to um, do more open source uh, uh, work in terms of what government buys from industry and making sure that uh, anything that the government contracts for is available to use or for use by other government agencies. Um, you know, that simple thing, you know, had a wonderful effect on improving cybersecurity, improving cost of establishing standards and those kinds of things. So um, I'm, I'm generally, in favor of it, um, but I think uh, you got to be careful in terms of what transparency you're actually talking about. Okay. Any other comments uh, from uh, Andy or any of you guys on, on verification? Well, I, I, I think uh, verification uh, needs to be part of the transparency kinds of issues that, that we've talked about somewhat before. Um, and it needs to be part of a broader issue of conformance programs. There are shared responsibilities between the telecom operators and the equipment vendors. Um, and uh, hopefully 
in terms of government setting those, uh, it really has to be led by the private sector uh, because you don't want the regulations to stifle innovation. You don't want them to stifle, stifle competition. You don't want to stifle, stifle assurance or transparency. And so trying to use methods of encouraging or even sometimes requiring disclosure by the key players, whether it's the operators uh, or the equipment vendors, can be more helpful than having overly uh, restrictive regulation. So conformance programs generally, but certainly when you look at the space of equipment vendors, the idea of having independent programs to verify uh, that requirements are met, uh, requirements steeped in, in international standards where possible, uh, best practices uh, w when necessary. Um, and the feedback loop from those processes can help uh, reduce the risk to everybody uh, and promote the resiliency. One final thing I'd say that as part of transparency, in our space, when equipment vendors are working with the operators to service the equipment or service the networks, there are methods that can be used and should be used that make it quite clear to both the telecom operators and to governments if necessary that there is limited ability of the equipment vendors to, to access any data that they're not supposed to, to access or to turn over that data to anybody else that they're not supposed to turn it over to. So methods that provide both assurance and transparency are absolutely essential as part of verification and conformance. Just a point on that is that there's a large body of experience around having an e a software ecosystem to enable uh, cybersecurity from all of the players. And telecommunications industry can learn from that history and leverage that as they establish standards and um, operational norms and best practices in these new networks. I think, um, Tony, you, you, having been on the private sector side and the public sector side, you know, the transformation that we're seeing today in mobile networks from an old TDM network to IP-based networks, is very similar to what we saw in the wireline business in 2000 with enterprise. When they went from TDM to IP, when you were at VMware or Microsoft or the Disney company, how did you secure your networks, you know, 15 years ago? And how's that different? How was it different then than it is today? Well, I think, you know, there's a couple of big differences. One, we're talking orders of magnitude difference in terms of the volume of uh, network traffic and data. Um, I think, um, and it's just a whole different world, number one. Um, there was a day when I probably could have described um, in pretty good detail all of the network traffic that was going on in my organization, and I could probably have described uh, who we communicated with and why and, uh, and so on. And I, I think for most institutions, we're way beyond that uh, ability now. So uh, automation plays a much, much bigger role in the management of security. Um, there's a couple of fundamental concepts, though, that I think still remain the same, which is you have to know what you're trying to protect and why, and you have to understand who the threat actors are, and you have to know something about how they're most likely to, uh, to want to attack you. But I want to bring up one thing which I think is a game changer, particularly as technologies continue to advance. There's a lot of discussion now around robotic process automation and, and the idea of machines doing things that humans used to do. And all of our, um, or a lot of our security schemes are based on personas, on what people can access or not access uh, in our networks and, and so on. And as machines start to take over the role of humans, we need to have much more richly developed concepts of machine identity and what those machines are able to access and actions that those machines can take uh, based on that access. And this is a I think underdeveloped concept in our scheme of how we think about uh, security. So um, I, I think, and, and again, automation will play a big key. Um, 
you know, I used to be able to go into Active Directory, for example, and I could understand what people had access to. Um, we need an Active Directory for what machines can yeah. <laughs> access in some ways, and I use that as a, um, you know, a, a, pr a proxy. It doesn't have to be a, a, uh, Active Directory, but this is a big problem that I think uh, needs a, a much better solve than uh, most of the approaches that we're using today. So, yeah, one one to expand on that the concept of a non-person entity that's uh, typically used in IT um, is more important when you are looking at these telecommunications infrastructures because you are going to be the backbone of the Internet of Things. And the non-person entity is that car that's talking to another car. It's the toaster that's talking to the refrigerator. Um, and each of these entities have a role. And as a telco operator, you'll need to work with your service providers jointly to understand what your end customers are doing, what they need done, and to understand the roles that each of these NPEs are playing within the entire ecosystem. This is a hard thing to do because you have to understand the data. You have to be able to, for instance, understand what's personally identifiable data, what's not personally identifiable data, what, in, what type of data one NPE can share with another NPE, and what are the laws and requirements from a governmental point of view with respect to the use of that data. A, a concept that's growing in importance is data sovereignty. And every country is actually putting in new laws, sometimes on a daily basis, about what type of data can be used and how that data can be shared. Um, at its heart, this is a cybersecurity concern, and it's a task that the telco operators need to undertake. Um, part of this is going to be the equipment that they purchase and use, but it's the telco operators that have to configure this equipment. The responsibility is going to be with the operators and the service providers. There is also responsibility with the end users. And from an educational point of view, the telco operators may need to fill the void with respect to the lack of information and understanding of the end user's role with respect to the protection of their own data. Yeah. Well, Andy, let's, um, let's move on to you and talk about the role of a vendor and, um, and other equipment providers, whether it's Huawei or any other um, equipment vendor in the ecosystem, in um, securing America's communications network. Well, as I said, the, uh, the vendor is part of the shared responsibility for, for the ecosystem and the close collaboration uh, with the telco operator to make sure that we are meeting their internal requirements and their external requirements, whether it's laws, whether it's regulation, uh, whether it's particular needs um, of their customers. So we have the requirement to address the risk from what we do uh, and from the risk from our supply chain. Uh, doing that in, in a transparent uh, uh, and effective, effective manner. So I think one of the exciting things uh, going forward is the uh, Network Equipment Security Assurance Scheme, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's GSMA and 3GPP uh, working with the mobile operators and working with the equipment vendors to come up with standards and a certification process for the telecom equipment because we fundamentally need an objective and transparent basis for knowing which products are worthy of trust, that the old models for trust are no longer valid. Uh, there's some broader issues also relevant, though, in, in the uh, telecom uh, operator space. Um, the question of working with the operators, working with governments to try to advance 
the, the, the state of security and assurance and functionality. Um, uh, we have a tremendous uh, burden in the United States on having an effective industrial policy. So we don't have the advantage, and obviously there are a lot of negatives to it, of basically having a government that can, you know, develop and enforce an industrial policy. We need to step up more than the public-private collaboration that we've had in the past, which is still important. The importance of sharing information, for example, in the current world and the evolving uh, 5G world. Um, we need to step up and say, okay, what is necessary to help make America more competitive in this space? What are the measures that need to take place to facilitate, for example, the digitization of the vertical industries for which the e tremendous expected growth in jobs is going to take place? You look at a document that was written in 2017 by our competitor Samsung, our supplier Intel, and the Securities Industry Association where they basically said there's a need for a public-private partnership going forward to make sure that the United States can maximize the development of those industries, that the regulations would not stand in the way, that only the most important regulations would be there, that there would be a coordinated strategy on who should do the R&D, what's most important. We basically have dropped the ball since 2017. We have to get back in the game of trying to figure out what is most important for this country to help us develop, to help us compete, to help us create the jobs that we're going to depend on so much going forward. So not to be led by the government, but led by the private sector. There may be certain R&D, for example, that you know, the government may need to fund, like the government funded you know, years ago in terms of things that led to the Internet. But we need to understand some of these tough questions and make some decisions. So there are assumptions that are existing out there now. There are assumptions that, well, the United States made a mistake by not having telecom equipment vendors to create the equipment for 5G. And there's an assumption by some that, that the U.S. has to build that capability to be competitive for 6G. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I mean, I think we need to have discussions by major leaders in the private sector in consultation with the government. Do we need instead to develop better abilities to monitor the networks to find anomalous conduct. You may have seen that DHS has called for that effort. NIST has come out with a request for comment about that ability, and, and, and Tony talked a little bit about monitoring, the ability to monitor the networks even after the equipment has been tested. And we assume that we will move toward regimes, even in the United States, of having effective testing of all equipment based on standards, and, and, and we favor that. So the idea of working together to figure out, and not just for uh, 5G, 6G, but, but AI, uh, the machine-to-machine -machine communications and sensor communications that Tony talked about, but other new technologies going forward. And some of that collaboration, we may, may need to have some exceptions like in, if, in, we have in the Homeland Security space that allows private companies to coordinate and share information with the government to help develop a stronger, at least informal, industrial policy so we can be competitive and we can do so with assurance. One thing I'd like to add is that in the past, there's been this concept of a trusted service provider that the federal government has used. That is an antiquated concept that has no role in the future. There must be a, a no trust policy so that whatever infrastructure you use, you can protect your data. It's a transition from a infrastructure-centric security model where you know what hardware is used, you vet the network that's being used, and you vet the organization that's actually managing that network. You have to go away from that infrastructure-centric viewpoint and transition to a data-centric viewpoint because you no longer, as a organization, as the government have control of the infrastructure. And in fact, you don't want to have control of the infrastructure. So that means you need to put data controls in place. You need to monitor that data. The protection of the data has to go with the data no matter where it goes, no matter what infrastructure it's flowing over. So the equipment provider becomes less and less important. Um, the technology, of course, is important. 
how you configure it, of course, is important. But that whole concept of trust needs to go away. There is a, a new trust model as you go into 5G. And it's important for telecommunications operators, service providers, and to government to recognize this sea change in the model. So Andy, I've, I've got up on, this, on the uh, presentation here one of your slides and maybe pick up on the role you see Huawei and other equipment providers playing in, in this um, kind of global ecosystem, but more importantly speak to the, uh, the, the point of having a global standards body sounds like a laudable idea, but how realistic is it to really have a global standard? Well, I think, I think the work that we see taking place with the, uh, the, the, the telco operators, the mobile operators, uh, and across the equipment vendor space, this network equipment security assurance scheme, uh, is very impressive and it, it holds out great promise where you set the requirements and you have mechanisms to test the products, uh, creating standards that are, are more nimble, more targeted than common criteria, but they build on the same kinds of concepts that common criteria has that are, that are recognized by some governments in the world. And I think this mechanism, this approach, uh, is going to be deemed very, very effective, and this is going to be a part of the contributing, creating greater objective and transparent mechanisms than we have before. Can we go to the next slide? Sure. So we think this is part of the larger effort. Uh, recently, the uh, chief technology officer of the European company Orange talked about the shared responsibility between the operators, the equipment vendors, and third-party providers. The NESAS that I just talked about, part of an overall approach to have standards and best practices. And they need not just be potential issues for government regulation, because you want to try to make sure that regulation helps provide assurance and transparency without being prescriptive so that it hurts innovation and hurts competition and, in fact, hurts the ability to keep creating. So that's one of the reasons the NESAS has more nimble requirements that can be transitioned over time as the threat environment changes. So we've laid out on this, and, and we'll make the, the slides available, a number of the different standards that are relevant. So in addition to the possible regulation or disclosure about whether companies are following things, um, is the idea that these kinds of things need to be built into procurement requirements. Because one of the greatest incentives to companies is you want to be able to sell your product or service. So you have to have risk-informed procurement requirements so that, and then, conformance programs so you can tell whether or not they comply to those. So that creates an entirely strengthened assurance program that can motivate the equipment vendors uh, and the telecom operators uh, to raise the bar. So we think those efforts like NESAS need to be strengthened and those need to be parts of some of these emerging programs that are going to be based on risk. So we see Germany with their BSI, we see the European Commission through uh, ANISA, the European Network Information Security Agency, um, and we even see in the United States that, that I think the experts know that we need to move in these directions, uh, and I, I think we will over time move in those, but the private sector and government need to make these very high priorities so we have this basis for assurance and trust. So Again, we, we see in the news today network security, 5G security. You talk about NISA and other government bodies in Europe. For the folks here in the room, kind of, kind of bring it down to our level of saying, what should the rural carriers be thinking about relative to securing their 4G networks and securing their uh, 5G networks? Andy, I'll kind of. Well, I think the, the communication, of course, between the rural operators, uh, the government regulators, uh, and the equipment vendors. Because I think there is a need, and we've had some sessions, in fact, we had the session, the closed door session with the FCC a, a year or two ago, working with one of the rural operators, that when folks think about risk, they can't just think about the equipment vendors, they've got to think about the operators. And of course, the rural operators are not fully funded in terms of being able to do everything they want. So the idea, and, and, and the Rural Broadband Alliance has, has done some work on this, uh, with an outside company, Domain 5, to try to identify what are the priority things that the, the, the rural operators can do that are most important to help them contribute to their part of the shared responsibility in addressing risk. And also to make sure that whoever is servicing those companies has the kind of mechanisms, like if you're going to access 
their networks, networks and data. You need to make sure you don't do it from the equipment vendor's network. You need specially configured laptops. You need to make sure when those laptops connect, every keystroke is recorded. That way the sessions can be fully uh, auditable and reconstructed so folks can know no equipment operator is taking access to data or sending data to anyone else. Those kinds of mechanisms are fundamentally important. And there are some additional basic things such as, you know, don't share passwords and try to make sure that traditional information security mechanisms are followed across the board by not only the tier ones but the tier threes as well. We've got 10 minutes left. I want to open up for questions and I've, held, I've got a few questions I can come back to. But um, um, let's open up to the audience. Anybody have any questions for the panelists? Uh, again, state your name and, and speak clearly into the microphone. Paul Kirby with TR Daily, Andy, recently accused the U.S. government of, of launching cyber attacks against it and pressuring employees to spy uh, for U.S. agencies. Can you provide any evidence of why you made those accusations? Well, let me put it this way. That was part of a statement that came out of headquarters, which demonstrates the sentiment of our company and most of our employees. Um, and uh, it was a heartfelt communication. Uh, I don't have specifics to respond. Uh, some of the things listed there, people are aware of the, of the particular actions, but I look at it more as, as, a, as, as a representation about how the company feels about what has been happening to us in the last six to eight months in particular. Good question. Any other questions from the audience? Um, I know that the panel talked a little bit about some of the, the rules and laws that the U.S. government has for security, but maybe uh, I wondered if you could just, are, are there a few like specific laws that are applicable to wireless carriers in regards to their network security? Like is there one specific piece of legislation that talks about carriers' networks should be secure, or, or is there not? I'm just kind of like, <laughs> like a 30,000 level view of like legislation that is specific to wireless carriers in terms of, you know, how secure their, their networks should be, or if there's not that. I, I just, I have no idea, so that's, that's my question. Well, my colleague who heads Congressional Relations for us, Don Morrissey's in the room, he might be able to help you on that later. It's my understanding there are not specific laws, there are information security requirements, sometimes there can be contractual requirements, um, so, so there aren't specific uh, uh, in the weeds requirements for the, uh, the, the operators. How about uh, 3GPP, where are they in developing a, a, a standard for cybersecurity? Well, 3GPP has been very active, particularly in the development of the evolution from 3G, 4G to 5G. Um, a tremendous coalition of, it's like 500 organizations participate in that. Um, and it's, it's interesting and there are real opportunities for engagement. Hopefully the U.S. government's going to get involved directly in this because as the, as the roadmap to 5G is unfolding, different business scenarios are going to be unfolding that are going to be creating opportunities. So the coalition is developing the standards and conformance measures uh, and NESAS is going to help provide those technical certification and, and testing requirements as they go forward. So what they do at each stage is do comprehensive threat modeling, which is absolutely essential. And then they prioritize the most important threats and so that standards, as these standards evolve, they identify fixes for the most important threats. But given the magnitude of the challenges and the fact that you can't eliminate all risk, you know, I encourage the United States, allies, other governments, major companies, you know, come on in, the water's fine. You know, you can contribute to these standards. You need to contribute to these standards because that's the kind of thing that's going to help make us safer if we work together to create these objective and transparent bases for trust. The United <clears throat> States needs to be tightly involved in the development of these business solutions because it's going to underlie the whole economic model, the global economic model. And the strength of the U.S. economy will depend upon how well U.S. companies leverage the uh, 4G transitioning to 5G networks and the environment. And if the government does not aid in the development of these standards, if they don't take a leading role in the development of these baseline cybersecurity measures, 
the United States as a whole would be, will be at a disadvantage in the economic world. Yeah, I was going to say, <clears throat> you guys, I think you have to look at what some of the underlying drivers are that are, you know, either going to cost companies money, <clears throat> excuse me, um, cost companies money or, or cause lawsuits. And right now in the U.S. in particular, but also in Europe, are privacy laws. So uh, I think carriers of any kind need to worry about you know, cyber incidents that could lead to um, fines or other things related to um, unwanted uh, privacy disclosures and so on. If you look at the biggest uh, legal issues and, and fines right now, this is the space. It's the space of, of privacy uh, issues um, and often uh, because of a cybersecurity uh, breach or, or flaw. Um, sometimes it's the design of the software itself, um, as in the case of some of the big social media companies. But, you know, these are the societal things that are driving a lot of the regulation and, and issues today. So California consumer privacy law, GDPR, uh, two examples. Let me just follow up that in the, in the telco space, the, the ISO standard 27,011, and there's an ITU standard that, that corresponds. One of the ways we do it in the United States, I think, which is, is so valuable, is the federal advisory group that supports the FCC, made up of all the major telecom operators. They've come up with recommendations for uh, standards and best practices related to 5G, related to Internet of Things. Uh, they've come up with recommendations for how individual organizations, everybody within the telecommunications sector, how they need to assess their own risk. They've also come up with recommendations about how they need to assess uh, the risk from their suppliers. I don't think there's been anything that drilled down and said, okay, here are the recommendations for specifically what the tier threes ought to do um, as they're part of it. Because when you're looking at risk management, it's partly about who you serve, what the dependency is, and how important that is to the overall uh, communication sector and, and the sectors that depend on it. We have a couple minutes left. Any other questions from the audience? Please, go ahead. Uh, there were John Nettles with Pine Belt Wireless in Alabama. A um, couple of questions, or maybe I'd like to ask you to expound on some things you said earlier about the government not picking winners and losers, what specifically you're referring to there. And then, Kevin, when you mentioned um, that the grant process and some of the discussions that you had last night with operators, the grant process is stymieing um, uh, competition or innovation, I guess. It's the sort of the, the race to the bottom, this reverse auction process, the mobility fund phase one is largely what put a lot of us in the position that we're in today in trying to deal with these, you know, these supposed, um, no offense to Huawei, but you know the equipment the vendors that are being deemed, I guess, you know, trying to be pushed out of out of the space. So, you, how how do we change all that? You want to start with the pick winners and losers. Who responded to that earlier, and then we'll talk about the uh, grant process and how it's impacting innovation. By winners and losers, I meant um, uh, picking companies based on things other than objective standards and testing, um, in conformance to the rules and so on. We have, uh, whenever we let politics get in. Uh, you know, things, you know, start to get a little crazy. Um, and it's not just in the telecom space, it's across all of our industries. And I think this is where the role of good standards, good, um, good testing, transparency, those kinds of things um, serve us better um, across the board. Uh, that's what I meant by that. Yeah, and with respect to the, the grants, I mentioned earlier that it's important for the tel telecommunications operators to change their internal culture. But this is even more important for government. They need to change their own internal culture. Case in point, a um, few years ago, there was a major breach at the Office of uh, uh, Personnel Management. Um, uh, and the government, when they went to court, they basically said, well, we're the government. We're immune to any prosecution. So, you know, it shouldn't be a problem here. But the court actually held that the government itself was blatantly responsible because they ignored 
the information, the data. They ignored what they were told about their failure to protect the information and data. So in essence, the court wasn't blaming whoever stole the data. It was blaming the U.S. government but not for not taking on and accepting the responsibility for protecting the data. This is a cultural change that has to happen across not just the U.S. federal government, but global governments. And that, in turn, will change or should change the policies and laws that need to be put in place in order to effect a strong ecosystem for cybersecurity. The, one of the things that is very important all this, following up uh, on Kevin's point, uh, accountability. It was one of the problems that was clear in the OPM breach, that there was not clear enough accountability. And the leaders of government, the leaders of private organizations, have to own cybersecurity and privacy risk. They need to know what their requirements are, that the board level companies have responsibilities to do due diligence regarding cybersecurity and privacy. They don't need to be experts. They need to make sure they use something like the NIST cybersecurity framework. If you're in the communication sector, they need to follow the guidance from the federal advisory group about the use of that framework uh, and about supply chain risk. Let me mention one other thing. I don't think there's enough emphasis on the importance of competition in the telecom equipment space. That there is a very fragile situation in the world about the number of equipment vendors and their capability to do the R&D and service folks that they need to take. We can't take the chance of losing companies from that competition. Look at what the UK Parliamentary Committee said earlier this year. They said, despite some of the concerns that the UK Government Oversight Board had said about Huawei software engineering processes that were working on it, they said the UK networks would be less secure if Huawei wasn't in them. And look at what's going on in China. Nobody talks about it. Look at the fact and ask yourself, why is it the China government lets Nokia and Ericsson compete freely in China for 5G? Why is it that Nokia and Ericsson beat Huawei out for some of the contracts in China. The China government recognizes, China companies recognize the importance of competition. That having competition in the market, whether it's the US market or the China market, helps encourage reduced prices, it helps encourage innovation, it helps encourage better security features, and of great importance to the UK Parliamentary Committee, it promotes resilience. You need multiple operators in the key space to promote the resilience of your communication networks. We have one yeah. other question here. So let's um, yeah, just last okay. question. All right, Jim Kale, uh, LHTC Broadband. Um, we've been told many times, and I've, I've done a number of interviews, and, and it's a network security issue, and, and obviously that's why we're all facing uh, this rip and potential rip and replace. Uh, and I, I think, uh, I, I assume everybody in, in this room are patriots. If, if we truly believed it was a, a national security threat, I don't think we'd be doing business. It'd be, you know, because when that, that's on the table, everything, you, know, you do whatever you have to do, whether you lose money or whatever it might be. But obviously, we don't believe that. And, and we haven't been given any evidence that it, it's a sense, it, it's kind of like a paranoia. It's, I've, I've heard and even talked to, uh, had a visit from the FBI saying we, we just know how they do business. We don't have any proof, but we know how China does business. And, and again, with this paranoia, I, I, I think personally, I think in, in many in this room think it's, it's something, the driver is something else. But with you guys being the experts, obviously, uh, you know, you don't believe it's a national security threat or a network security threat. What do you think the driver is? Is it, is it competition trying, because Huawei is ahead of the game on 5G, uh, is it a trade issue We're getting caught up in this trade war? Is it being used as a bargaining chip? Uh, you know, if, if it were a bargaining chip, uh, we certainly wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't be nothing. You don't negotiate with, with someone who's trying to destroy you. So anyway, we all believe, I think that's, that's a general consensus in this room, that it's not a, a security threat. So what do you think it is? What, what is the main driver? And there may be a couple different drivers behind that. It's a great way to finish. Kevin, yeah. we'll go right down the line. Okay, um, I am you do it five minutes or less. Five minutes or less. Absolutely. I can't say what's driving it, but I know what's fueling it. It's a lack of understanding of the basic technology 
and of how telecommunications infrastructures will operate going forward. That is fueling the paranoia. Um, and that's my viewpoint. But does that does that assume that we're being that that whoever's behind this really believes that it's a national or or, or is it some they have they, a criteria, I, a criteria think, motive? Now we're believing you know, that's that's based on the assumption that they're operating in good faith. Right? I believe they right. are operating in good faith, but they're operating with a lack of knowledge, and that's very very scary. Yeah, my point of view is that <clears throat> a lot of this is focused in the wrong place, a lot of the paranoia. Um, the discussion has been around supply chain issues. Um, and if you look at the reality of where cybersecurity breaches happen and so on, it doesn't happen in the supply chain. It happens once you've installed equipment, it's operating in your environment, and maintenance activities take place. Um, configurations, you know, don't get done the right way, all of those kinds of things. So I wish we were putting as much energy into good cyber hygiene once equipment's been in place and take all that energy that's been, I think, wrongly focused on supply chain. Um, you can take anybody's equipment and configure it the wrong way and have cyber issues. and. That's really where we need to put the, uh, the emphasis and the energy from my perspective. I think certainly there's a geopolitical, con <clears throat> geopolitical context for this, um, which, and there's a political overlay that is preventing the experts in government from having the conversations we would normally have. I mean, I think back to when Edward Snowden in about 2014 revealed information about the PRISM program. Uh, where the U.S. government was using American companies to spy around the world, such as Cisco. And the question was asked, well, did Cisco let them do it, or did they do it uh, just on their own? Well, the fact is, when we look at real cybersecurity risk, and real cybersecurity risk is a part of this discussion, at least five nations of the world can virtually implant malware or hidden functionality through everybody's systems, which is why, from my perspective, perspective and why from our company's perspective, there need to be these programs to test everybody's products. Because it doesn't matter to me whether Cisco gave permission. The fact is we got to make America safer. And then we got to make sure those mechanisms are in place to help deal with what the, the, the major nation states would do. If it weren't for the fact that we were in the middle of these trade talks where, where Huawei's been, been put in the middle, there would be conversations that are not now being held. Um, the, uh, so as we look at the situation, um, there are, I, I do see a lot of good work that DHS is, is working on to try to make, come up with comprehensive programs to make America safer. Comprehensive programs, as a senior official of the State Department said yesterday, the day before, you know, they said, we're not trying to block Huawei around the world. We want these governments to have comprehensive programs. That's what we all need is comprehensive programs. And so we want to support that and support the efforts of NESAS, for example, 3GBP and, and GSMA, uh, the efforts of other standards groups around the world. I mentioned Germany, the European Union, the efforts of DHS. The, the capabilities are there to make us safer. We've got to create better monitoring capabilities generally, but we need greater transparency. Um, right now, uh, we aren't learning lessons from the real world of cybersecurity and what's necessary for all of us. You know, in effect, block Huawei if you must, but let's do those measures that are necessary to make America safer. Let's learn lessons from how, in some cases, there's strong arguments that the heartland of America has been hurt by improper practices from foreign governments in terms of pricing and dumping. Well, nobody's talking about changing those laws that tie the hands of the American companies to bring action against that kind of improper conduct. So we have to create those kinds of laws, because in the future, these things may happen as well. It's like the OPM breach. You've got to learn lessons from that and put measures in place to help make us safer. But nobody's focusing on things like, what are the laws that are necessary to make us safer against foreign dumping? You know, efforts to make, like, the World Trade Organization more effective. So our hope is that some of these efforts in other countries, Germany, Europe, and so forth, that they're going to come up with 
me measures and mechanisms to provide that global basis for knowing which products and services are worthy of trust, to have the conformance programs for the operators and the equipment vendors, to have the testing of the products so you get trust through verification. So regardless of whose products it is, you can know you can protect against the most significant malicious actors in the world. When that happens, we'll be able to compete in the United States and we'll be able to compete elsewhere. But for now, we've got to make sure we're doing everything possible to make America safer. And, and we want to support that regardless of whether it benefits Huawei. Okay. We are out of time. Thank Let's you. Let's give the uh, panelists a big hand. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great job.